Hello, welcome to this special edition of the Balancing Act, Behind the Mystery. I'm Olga Villaverde. Today, two rare diseases. While they may not be very common, they can have devastating effects on the patient, their families, and caregivers. Let's learn more. We begin with polycystic kidney disease, or PKD. There are two types of PKD. The first is autosomal recessive polycystic kidney disease, or ARPKD, which is a less common form of polycystic kidney disease and can be found in children. Then there is autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease, or ADPKD, the most common type of polycystic kidney disease, and our focus here today. Now, it's a rare genetic condition, and approximately 140,000 Americans have been diagnosed with it. And there may be more who are undiagnosed. For Sarah, she knew at an early age that ADPKD would impact her future. Take a look. Quite a few people in my family have ADPKD. My mom, my grandma, my uncle, my great-grandmother, all of them have it. And I knew that I had a 50% chance of having it as well. I knew from an early age that my story and my life was going to be different. The Balancing Act traveled to Yale School of Medicine to meet with Dr. Neera Dahl, who has expertise in the diagnosis and management of genetic kidney diseases, including ADPKD. ADPKD is an inherited genetic disease. It stands for autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. Autosomal means that it is inherited equally in both men and women, and dominant means that it's a dominant gene, so each child has a one out of two uh, chance of inheriting that from their parent. Um, the polycystic kidney disease, so this is a disease in which there is gradual increase in kidney cysts within the kidney, and that leads to an increase in kidney size and eventually to uh, kidney failure and the need for either transplantation or initiation of dialysis. At 19, Sarah experienced a dizzy spell, high blood pressure, and an elevated heart rate and was referred to see a nephrologist. To be officially diagnosed, I had a sonogram. I sat in my nephrologist's office and looked at those films and heard him say the words, ADPKD, and it became real. It was the first time that I started to think about what the end of this disease might mean for me. I was angry. I was sad. I was terrified. I was so upset. I just, I didn't understand why my parents would have children knowing that they could pass this disease on to me. I wish I had done things differently, but I didn't. I chose to ignore the fact that ADPKD was real, it was here, and it was in front of me right now. I didn't do anything that would have actually helped my symptoms. When they would pop up, I would manage them and then pretend they didn't exist. And I started emotionally eating as a way to cope with my diagnosis. The heavier I got, the more I was straining my kidneys. The symptoms of ADPKD that are attributable to the kidney can be development of high blood pressure, uh, having more urinary tract infections or cyst infections, having kidney stones, having flank or abdominal pain to those enlarging cysts. And then outside the kidney, the cysts can be growing in the liver and sometimes that can cause feeling full before you've eaten a full meal or with reflux. Other symptoms could be concern about the intracranial aneurysms and getting that checked. It's important that if you have a family history of ADPKD, to talk to your family, get screened, and speak to a doctor about your prognosis. ADPKD is primarily diagnosed by clinical imaging, either an ultrasound, CT, or MRI of the kidneys. The times genetic testing is most useful is either in someone who has an equivocal imaging result 
or someone with no family history where we're not certain of the diagnosis, or in a patient who's considering pre-implantation genetic diagnosis where they want to make sure that they're not passing the gene on to their, their children. Everyone with a family history should get that first imaging test, routine blood pressure measurements, routine urine analysis to see if they're developing blood in the urine. And that helps in terms of life planning, in terms of thinking about how this disease is likely to affect you. Over 10 years after seeing her first nephrologist, Sarah started to take charge of her health and accept her diagnosis of ADPKD. I sat down with my nurse practitioner. She told me that if I didn't do something, I was gonna be a diabetic. This wasn't an if, this was a when. And that with the ADPKD, I was headed straight for dialysis. I knew that I had to do something about how I was taking care of myself. My weight would disqualify me for a kidney transplant in the future, which was a big deal. I had been treating this like it was nothing, like the future was so far away I would never get there. It forced me to take a second, breathe, accept that I had this disease, and find a way to move forward. With diet and exercise, I got my health and my weight under control. I know where this disease will lead, and I'm going to do everything I can to live my life along the way. ADPKD is a progressive disease. Dr. Dahl describes what this can mean for patients. One of the things that tells us how quickly someone is likely to progress is the size of the kidneys. In clinic, uh, we will look at those images with the patients and review what their kidney size is, what their total kidney volume is, and how that may impact their likelihood of progression when we think they may develop end-stage renal disease, when we think they may start to lose kidney function. And that's really one of the things that we've been able to do now in the recent years that we haven't been able to do before. And we can often do that before there's any loss of kidney function. And one of the reasons we really encourage patients to come in and see us early. A lot of people have a lot of fear regarding the potential diagnosis of ADPKD. Oftentimes they've seen what that disease has done to aunts or uncles or to their parents and they're, they're concerned about that um, and don't know what it would mean for them to also have that disease. We really wanna uh, reassure patients that there is more now that we can do compared to 10 years ago or 15 years ago. It was extremely difficult to share my diagnosis of ADPKD with my husband. I knew that having this disease meant I could pass it to our future children. It has been a struggle for me to know if I wanted children or not. I'm actually pregnant and we're expecting our first child, so we decided to take the leap and go for it. It would be lying to tell you that I wasn't scared. I'm terrified and I will feel horrible if my child inherits this disease from me. Today I'm in so much of a better place than I was. I know how to manage my health and my weight. I have a new perspective on life and on what it has in store for me. What I encourage people to do is to come in and to become well-educated. There's a lot of information available on ADPKD, so we'd really encourage you to come in and take control of that disease. My advice to another patient with ADPKD this will never define who you are. It's a part of you, but you can still do fabulous, great things with your life. I'm gonna do everything I can to stay healthy and to just live my life along the way. It won't stop me from doing everything that I want to do. For more information about autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease, you can visit pkdinfo.com and pkdcure.org. You can also visit our website, thebalancingact.com. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Next on Behind the Mystery, a disease that is often misdiagnosed and affects at least 500 to 1,000 patients each year in the U.S. Blastic plasma cytoid dendritic cell neoplasm, or BPDCN, is an aggressive and often fatal blood cancer that can mimic a dermatologic or skin condition. We're going to hear from one patient who has BPDCN, but first, let's learn the basics from oncologist Dr. Kendra Sweet from the Moffitt Cancer Center in Tampa, Florida.
BPDCN is short for Blastic Plasma Cytoid Dendritic Cell Neoplasm. It's a rare but very aggressive form of cancer that affects the bone marrow and the blood. In addition to the bone marrow and the blood, it can also affect other organs like the skin, lymph nodes, spleen, and in some cases even the central nervous system. And over time, BPDCN can progress, usually very quickly, and behave much like a very high-risk acute leukemia. The exact prevalence of BPDCN is not really known for a variety of reasons. One is because I think it's commonly misdiagnosed. BPDCN can affect anyone of any race or ethnicity. About 75% of patients are men, with a median age of diagnosis ranging somewhere between 60 and 70 years. And about 10 to 20% of patients will have had a prior blood cancer diagnosed before their diagnosis of BPDCN. So historically speaking, the median survival from the time of diagnosis is anywhere from eight to 14 months. And without treatment is oftentimes fatal. If the bone marrow is involved, then they may experience symptoms of low blood counts, such as fatigue, bleeding, bruising, and large lymph nodes may experience fevers. The symptoms can be fairly vague and can oftentimes be attributed to something more common um, until you put the whole story together. In 80% of cases, patients will present with or develop skin lesions of various size, shape, and color. The skin lesions in BPDCN can be variable. Some patients may present with a nodular lesion that's raised, some it will be more like a bruise, sometimes a, a patch or a plaque. If somebody notices a suspicious lesion on their skin, it's critical that the affected area be biopsied and that blood tests get run, then be very quickly referred to a hematologist oncologist Dan Beers was enjoying life with his wife when his diagnosis came out of nowhere. While most BPDCN patients present with skin lesions, Dan was unique in that his disease only involved his bone marrow and blood. I always like to play a lot of golf. Uh, my wife considered herself a golf widow, and I, I used to go out with my friends a lot, and I did a lot of traveling, an awful lot of traveling. I was living my life and enjoying my life quite, quite immensely before I was diagnosed. Dan underwent routine pre-op testing for a surgical procedure. After his blood results came back abnormal, he was referred to a hematologist. Every time he tested my blood again that it was getting worse, not better, and that there was seriously something wrong and he was looking for different diseases, he couldn't quite figure out what happened. And he finally said that, uh, I, I don't know what's wrong with you. You need to see academics because I don't think another doctor can help you. I was a little depressed, alarmed, and then in somewhat of disbelief. A delay in obtaining the correct diagnosis can mean disease progression may have already occurred. Dr. Sweet discusses why BPDCN is difficult to diagnose. BPDCN can oftentimes be confused for other more common forms of blood cancer like acute myeloid leukemia with skin manifestations like leukemia acutis or in some cases a non-Hodgkin lymphoma or acute lymphoblastic leukemia or a chronic myelomonocytic leukemia. It requires a little bit more effort on the part of the pathologist and the treating team, I think, to conclude that the diagnosis truly is BPDCN. Dan was first misdiagnosed with AML, but after six months and seeing 10 different doctors, Dan received the correct diagnosis. Well, more results have come in and that uh, you don't have AML. And I said, oh, that, that's good. And he said, no, it's worse. You have BPDCN and at this time, there's no cure and there's no drug for it. So you need to go home and get your affairs in order, and that shocked me. There is a signature triad of markers that would be detected in, in a patient with BPDCN. So these abnormal cells have proteins on the surface that when tested for, we would find positive for something called CD123, another marker called CD4, and another one called CD56. And this combination, when seen all together, is, is diagnostic of BPDCN. He called me and said, we're starting a trial and you're qualified for it. And I started the treatment with uh, 
SL-401, or El Zandris, as they call it now. When we come back, we're going to discuss treatment options providing hope for patients. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Today we're talking about BPDCN, an often fatal cancer affecting the bone marrow, blood, and skin. Dr. Sweet discusses treatment options for the disease. Historically speaking, treatments were chemotherapy regimens that would be used for other forms of leukemia, like acute myeloid leukemia or acute lymphoblastic leukemia, or in some cases, a non-Hodgkin lymphoma. In addition to that, we have stem cell transplant, which is a potentially curative therapy for patients with this disease. There is a treatment for BPDCN approved by the FDA specifically for the treatment of this disease. In 2018, the FDA approved Elzonris, the first and only treatment for BPDCN in adult and pediatric patients two years and older. For Dan, Elzonris provided hope where he thought there was none. Elzonris may cause serious side effects such as capillary leak syndrome, hypersensitivity reactions, or liver damage. See important safety information, including the body warning for Elzandris at the end of this segment. I'm on a drug called Elzandris and it's been treating my BPDCN. I kind of felt a, a, a sense of a relief or a, some sort of hope. And uh, I decided then that I would put my, put my, uh, all my effort into it. And I, that's what I did. I went back and, uh, and fought. I managed to make it through. My advice would be to find a specialty center with people who know this disease. It's exciting to see treatments in a setting where we previously had none, and we're improving the lives of these patients. And when you see that, it makes you wanna work harder to find something even better, even more effective, something that may be a cure for this disease um, if we just keep trying. This extra time with my family has been more than a gift. My opinion on something like what I have here is to keep moving on. You can't look backward and go uh, bury your head in the sand about it. You got to keep forward and you got to fight it. For more information on BPDCN, visit aboutbpdcn.com. And you can always visit our website, thebalancingact.com. Important safety information, as well as the full prescribing information, is available at elzonris.com. for joining us. We hope you learned more about these two rare and genetic diseases. Stay tuned for more Behind the Mysteries and remember to head to our Facebook page and our website. Follow us on Twitter and we'll see you next time.